Back up. Hey, welcome. Call him up. Second of October. Anybody want to call him? Hey. Two October, Monday. It's all going to start again. Broadcasting from St. Charles, Missouri. My name is Missionary Norman Edgar O E T K E R. You're listening to a great song. A lot of people sing it. It's called Jesus on the Main Line. This is by Willie Johnson singing this. It's a good song. Get you going here this Monday. Today we're going to talk about death and you. Are you ready to hear about how your death is going to be? Have you ever heard anyone said you're going to death? This Monday, just like them folks out in Las Vegas, they didn't know it was coming, and it was upon them. And the same thing's going to happen to you. I know a lot of people think, well, it's never going to get around me. You know, it happens all the time. People say, well... A lot of people say, take this attitude, well, if it happens, it happens. When your number's up, that's it. A lot of people say that. All right? You'd be surprised how many people don't realize that they are actually going to hell. And as a Protestant Christian missionary, I have great compassion for the unsaved the ignorant of the gospel of grace, justification through Christ. But the worst lot out there is the people that think they're Christians. You talk to guys today and gals and uh, you, they'll say, you ask them, are you a Christian? And they'll say, oh yeah, I'm a Christian. And of course the follow-up question, I've been in this business 43 years as a Protestant Christian missionary. Five tours into Asia, up in the Himalayan mountains, and seven years into Mexico. I've been around all kinds of religions, and the worst of the whole lot are the Christians, the people that say they're Christian. And I'll tell you why. The biggest fault and problem on this earth is evil. And all truly spiritually born again people have power over evil. But the so-called Christian people are not really spiritually born again people. They're just religionists. Today's Christians are no different from Islam or Buddhists or Roman Catholics or Mormons or Jehovah Witnesses. There's absolutely no difference. You have an internet problem. Thank you. So today, when uh, when you ask someone, are you spiritually born again? They will say, oh yes, I'm spiritually born again. And then when you ask them, what is your ministry? What is it that you do? And they kind of hee-haw around a little bit. And they really aren't in any kind of full-time ministry. But they believe that they're saved and going to heaven because they accepted Christ. But as far as doing anything for the gospel, that's not necessary because their belief is in Christ. And so they're going to heaven. As long as they stay pretty good, you know, not get in a lot of trouble. 
that sin trouble that is going out and committing sin. But I want you to just take a look at what really goes on. <clears throat> when you say to someone today, are you going to go into ministry, at Protestant, Christian, Bible, New Testament, truths of Jesus, are you going to go tell people those truths? What they'll say is things like this. They're thinking about going into the ministry, and the only idea they have of going into ministry is the person that they're emulating. And you can rest assured they're not emulating Jesus Christ. They're emulating they're either some kind of televangelist or some kind of preacher in their own hometown or some kind of visiting evangelist or whatever. And when people think about going into ministry, they don't think about anything about Jesus. They're thinking about how they're going to be supported, how God's going to bless them to get money to live on. All right? That's the way it goes, All right? believe it or not. <coughs> and then you got this whole line of people out there that believe that if their vocation is in religion, that they should be paid equally as much as a lawyer or a doctor. That would be your Lutheran and Presbyterian guys. All right, they get their masters and DDs and think they're king of the road. Everybody that gets involved in Christian ministry thinks well, how I'm going to get paid, how I'm going to get money. All right. They want to have their own little parsonage. They want to have their own little church group. They want to have their own little church because in their mind's eye, that's how you become a minister and that's how you share the gospel with Jesus Christ. You get a building and you put a cross on top, get people to come and you pay. All right? Pay money to the church. And the more people you get in the church, the more money you'll make. And that's simple. That's all there is to it. I told you out here in St. Charles one time, I went to a church and I was invited to the board meeting. I went to the board meeting, had a big old graft up on the board there, PowerPoint presentation. 80% of the pie they showed was the pastor's salary. 80%. Thousands of dollars went straight in his pocket. <laughs> Anybody with a little bit of sense can put two and two together. One day, one of the old boys in that church house had a heart attack, right? You know what happened several weeks after that? They started an exercise program for the whole church. Because this big money donor have had a heart attack, now they start an exercise program. All these obese, overweight people start coming there to do exercise in the church because God blesses that. They don't talk about the spirit of gluttony, but, but these the people don't follow Jesus, folks. People follow what the group wants done. It's a group thing. It's not a denominational thing. I was in the setting one time where no boy came in, two couples came in, and they were in their uh, I'd say. Uh, Late 30s, early 40s. Husband and wife, one here. Husband and wife, another one here. Both sitting in the church service, not five pews apart from each other. And the old boy told me that's his daughter up there. And she was married to this other guy. He left her, married another gal, or shacked up with this other gal, and then they got married. You understand? And here are the four... These two couples were sitting in the same church house together, worshiping the Lord. Adulterers. That's just incredible. And the pastor doesn't say anything because he wants that money. You understand? He started calling people out. People wouldn't come. So today, when you go and you see the people today, and you ask them if they're going into ministry, the only thing they can think about is... Well, what is ministry? And they immediately think about their needs. How am I going to be supported? I know, I thought the same thing when I got involved, when I first got involved, when I was 28 years old. I'm 71 now. 
And I thought also, just like it, well, how am I going to, who's going to support me? I can't blah, blah, blah. And just all these questions came in. And the only one thing you have to imitate, I want to take it back, not imitate. Uh, now the word escapes me. <laughs> but in, but in, emulate is Jesus Christ in the New Testament. So if you, in fact, People think that God calls people to the ministry. This is, this is the biggest fallacy, a lie from the devil. People believe that God calls certain people to the ministry. And that other people aren't called. Right? You've heard it, I know. And, you know so, you, then you have to ask yourself, why would God call one person and not call another person. Alright? Now, God sent Jesus to do what? To save the world and not to condemn the world. But God chooses only one guy. Why would why would people think that? Why and just like people think Billy Graham is a Christian evangelist. He's no more a Christian than a man in the moon. You listen to his own voice, his own speaking. Billy Graham, Franklin Graham, the Southern Baptist, they are not worried about your eternal salvation. These are predestination people. They have the theology that God chose them, the Southern Baptist, Billy Franklin Graham, that God chose them before they were born to go to heaven and everyone else is going to hell. They believe they're called of God, the elect, the predestined. All right? These guys are evil people. They don't believe the Bible where Jesus says, go forth, teach, and make disciples. When a person believes that certain people are called, then that person can make up anything like this Osteen guy. People really believe, hello from Russia, hi Russia, people really believe that Osteen, this guy that has a church in Texas, is a real man of God. This guy is no more a, a man of God than a man in the moon. But people will look at that because they have an idea in their head, well, if I was a televangelist, that's the way I would be, rich and powerful. And the devil comes along and tells people today, for you to have ministry, you need to be like the Old Testament and be blessed by God, and God would give you everything. And then you got people that actually believe that. They actually believe it. They give God some money, and doing the Old Testament tithing, give God 10% of your income, and of course it's a fallacy. It was never set up <coughs> like it's used today. If you give God 10%, these prosperity, Benny Hinn, and all these prosperity preachers, oh, you just, they're all over. They, all the televangelists, Joy Smart, all of them, they'll tell you you'll be blessed by God. The faith church, community church, everybody, messenger, everybody, all the different denominational, non-denominational church, they'll tell you the same doctrine. If you will give to God, God will give you tenfold, hundredfold back. And they'll present it to you as some kind of contractual agreement that you have with God. You give God a dollar, God will give you back 50. Or whatever whatever number they want to put in their head. And people are so greedy and self-centered that they bite into that apple all the time. Just like Adam and Eve did. Sin. And anything that comes to them, they'll jump up and testify. Look what God did for me. It hasn't got anything to do with God. People that want to be in ministry think that they should have money, wealth, and power. They'll drive Cadillacs, new cars, everything. Everything should be great for them because they're in the thing about God. 
And yet all the people that they'll be around are poor people, but they have to be in the good shoes. They have to be in the new car, the new suit, the new tie. They got to look sharp because they're under the illusion that as a Christian, they got some great wealth given to them by God. And it's just not the truth at all. But that's the Christian today. They're in an illusion of this grandeur of something that they see. They go to a church house, they see a pastor, and they'll see the car he drives, how he dressed, the house he lives in, and they think that's the ministry. And so if, if they're going to go into ministry, they want to make money just like this guy's making money. All right? So I'm going to read you some things about if you're thinking about being a believer, and of course, a lot of you will never enter into it. A lot of, sad to say, but a lot of you folks will never make heaven. You're going to hell. And you know it, you know it, I know it, and some of you don't care. And you better start caring. Let me read you some things. This is the cross that a Christian bears. Now, you can ignore what I'm saying. You can just discard it and, and tune me out, delete me, anything else. But these words still stand. You will be hated by all because of my name, Jesus. But it is the one who has endured to the end who will be saved. So ask yourself, are you hated because you believe in Jesus and stand for Jesus? Listen to this. You will be hated by all because of my name, but the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. So if you think that you can live your little nine to five job life and go to church on Sunday and never talk about Jesus and then all of a sudden at the end of your life you're going to heaven. How many people don't like you because you talk about Jesus? I bet there isn't very many because you never talk about Jesus. This is for them people to think they're a Christian. But beware of men, for they will hand you over to the courts and scourge you in their synagogues. In talking modern day, this is talking about religious people. What, they'll, what the religions will do to you today if you don't go along with the doctrines. You come up against a Pentecostal, you come up against a Southern Baptist or a Presbyterian or a Lutheran. And bring the plain scriptures out to them. They'll gnash on you. They don't want to hear the truth. They don't want to hear that gospel. They want to believe what they believe. And if you try to say one thing other than that, they'll run you out in a heartbeat. Therefore, behold, I'm sending you prophets and wise men and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify, and some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city. That's Jesus talking. Matthew 24, 9. They will deliver you to tribulation and will kill you, and you will be hated by all nations because of my name, Jesus. So how's your life going? Are you being hated for the name of Jesus? Not because your family was born in a Christian environment. People got this idea that Christians are being persecuted and murdered. People think they're Christian because their mom and dad's a Christian or because they were baptized as a baby and so that makes them a Christian. I can't tell you how many people I talk to, I say, are you, oh yeah, I said, well when did you get saved? Oh, we always been a Christian, my family's been in church for billions of years. I have no idea the gospel message of salvation. They're lost in church doctrine. You will be surprised how many, this thing, uh, martyrs for Jesus and all this, 
These groups want money. That's all they're after. They want more money given to them. People are killed, killed, evil for evil, because they don't think the same way. Or they're a different tribe or nation. The other people kill because we're in an evil place. Not necessarily because they believe in Jesus. You said Roman Catholics don't believe in Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. They don't accept that doctrine. They believe in the seven sacraments that the church instituted. You understand that Southern Baptists aren't Christian. They believe that they're called of God before they're born. They're going to heaven. Everybody else is going to hell. Jehovah Witnesses think they're the true ones. Joseph Smith, the Mormon guy, found it underneath of a rock. They think they're the true ones. They're all evil. These guys aren't telling you the truth, the way of salvation through Jesus Christ. They're evil. And when they're killed, people say, oh, they're martyrs for Jesus. No, they're not. They're evil upon evil. Let me tell you, it rains on the just and unjust. If you want to be a Christian, listen to what you got in, in store for but you will be betrayed even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends. And they will put some of you to death, and you will be hated by all because of my name, Jesus. So you that are a Christian today, you that say Jesus is your Lord out there, are you being hated for the name of Jesus in your life? Are people mocking you because of your love for Jesus? You that hear my voice, not at all. You're not talking about Jesus except when you go into that church house. Your 9 to 5 job, you can put you right upside of a sinner and there'll be no difference. Today, the Protestant Christians are such hypocrites they don't even realize it. You understand it's like the old frog. <laughs> old frog. <laughs> Put a pan of water on the stove, right in the water, he just set a frog in that pan. And he doesn't realize that that water's getting hotter. You turn that stove up hotter and hotter, that ro and that frog in the pan doesn't realize it's getting hotter. And he's destroyed. That's what the so-called people that call themselves Christian today are just like that frog. They're evil. I've seen so many, especially here on, uh, we've been on Periscope for over a year now. Let me give you some stats. As of yesterday, October 1st, we're at 30,000, <coughs> excuse me, 30,358 views on Periscope. Hearts on Periscope is at 260,651. On YouTube, we have 63,510 views. If you think that you're a Christian and you haven't suffered anything for the name of Jesus, well, you better think again a little bit. Acts 14.22, this is the Christian. This is what's going to be happening to you. Strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, <coughs> and saying, Through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. You understand, tribulations means because you openly profess Jesus Christ to your bank to your loan officer, to the people you work with, that you stand for Jesus, that Jesus is your personal Lord and Savior. Do people know that about you at where you work and what you do? You that think you're a Protestant Christian? You that think, yes, I'm a Christian, I accepted Jesus? Or is your life saying, oh yeah, I'm a Christian, you need to get saved. And then your own personal life, you're not in any kind of full-time ministry. People that are not in full-time ministry 
there's only one reason. Because they're doing what they think is right within their own eyes. When God, when you, the people got this idea that God calls certain people to do certain things. That's not true. You understand, you'll see, you go to the overpriced Christian bookstores, you'll see all these fantastic books that people have written about missionaries and God called this person, called this lady, da-da-da. You see it all the time. And that's the fallacy. God does not call certain people. God didn't come down to my life, in my life, 43 years ago and say, Norman, I want you to go to Thailand up in the Himalayan mountains and be the first missionary into this village called Napa Pak. He didn't do it. And God doesn't tell anyone what they're going to do before, the, before it actually happens. The only way that you can be a missionary, the only way you can be a worker, pastor, minister for God is when you first, you the human, after you're saved, you have to what? You have to say to God that you want to serve Him with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength. When you surrender to God, there's three things going to happen when you surrender to God. Number one, you're going to say to God, you're sorry for your rebellious attitude. Number two, you're going to say to the Lord, you want Jesus as your Savior and Master and Lord. And number three, you're going to say, you will follow the truths of Jesus in the Protestant Christian Bible New Testament. You'll read them and you'll do them. If you don't obey the words of Jesus that you read, not what some pastor guy tells you, not what I say, no matter what anybody, your mommy, daddy, nothing. What you read and what you understand, if you don't do it, you're not a Christian. You got to be faithful to the end. You don't get some kind of green card or a pass after you're in this thing for a couple of years. Okay, you made it. Come on in, skate now. No, it doesn't work like that. Listen to this. For for to you it has been granted for Christ's sake not only to believe in Him, but also to suffer for His sake. How do you know what you want to do in Christ? You'll never know until you come to God in faith, you alone, and say, God, I submit my life to you. I want to be a worker for you. Then God will tell you what your calling is or lead you in that way. He doesn't, go, he doesn't tell you beforehand, folks. It doesn't work like that. I don't care who tells you anything different. I'm telling you, it doesn't work like that. You're going to say, now, you'll find all kinds of people that are trying to do some Christian work because they think that's what's right in their own mind and eye to do. You got to hear from that small, still voice of the Lord. When God calls you, God to make a way, and you can rest assured it's not going to be in driving a Cadillac. This idea that people think you got to be blessed with material things that to prove to somebody you're a, a real evangelist, or a real pastor, or a real missionary, or a real Christian, you got to have wealth and prosperity. That's the devil talking. Evil. Jesus said, take up that cross of self-denial daily. But then you got people that, that go off in left field about that. You got the Amish and Mennonite thinking they're so holy that they'll ride around in a horse and buggy. The world's going to hell in a handbasket and they're running around. Giddy up, horsey. 
You understand that it's, I cannot understand how weird people really are at times. There's only one Bible. There's only one Protestant Christian Bible New Testament. There isn't a thousand different versions of it. It all say the same thing. All the Protestant Christian Bible New Testament say the same truths. But walk in any of these church houses and everybody's got a different opinion. They can't be right. So that ought to tell you, get out of them church houses and get that New Testament and you're going to have to read it. You're going to have to do it. If you don't do it, you're going to hell. And you, Well, you know that anyway. Do not fear what you're about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison. So that you will be tested and you will have tribulation for ten days. Be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. Be faithful <laughs> until death. Let me tell you, I'm 71 and I, I already been at death's door a couple of times. Matter of fact, just a couple of years back, I was in the hospital. I had no blood pressure, and my organs shut down. They they said I was dead. Call call your people in. <laughs> Here I am, yet. You got to be faithful, no matter what you're going through. Young, old, indifferent doesn't make any difference. You got to stay faithful to Jesus if you call yourself a Christian. And these people that tell me, oh, yeah, I was involved with the Lord, but I was a backslider. Let me tell you something. Back 99.9% .9 of people that say they used to go to church and used to be in the Lord and all that, they were never in the Lord. They were just going to some church, some group. They'd never been spiritually born again. But if you've been spiritually born again... Walking in the walk and you turn from the Lord, you know who I'm talking about. Can you explain to me why should God submit his only son to horrific tortures to forgive us? Wow. Well, we, we could go into blues. We could go into great detail about the particular type of suffering and the reason for that. You know, their scripture should by his stripes were healed. Hi there. One of the the overreaching context of of God becoming a human USA. Okay. <coughs> yes, I'm in the United States. This spiritual substance we call God took on a form at creation and communicated with Adam. We read that God, the spiritual substance that created everything that we know, had a human type form because the scripture says in the Old Testament book of Genesis that he walked with Adam in the cool of the night. So God can take on a lot of different shapes, whatever he chooses to do. But he's a spiritual substance, all right? He created man, all right? Man failed, okay? So then God made a promise. He said to the woman in Genesis 3.15, I'm going to send one in the future that's going to free you from the power of sin, all right? Now, what you really need to think about, blues. Any answer? Yes, I'm giving you the answer now, blues. you got to listen. You might have to play the rewind to hear this out, but I'll finish this, blues. If you lose contact, just rewind this thing. And it'll go on YouTube also and then on our website. God said to Adam at the time he sinned, I'm going to send one in the future that's going to defeat and crush the power of sin. 
Now, up until that point, Adam and Eve did not know right from wrong. They were completely innocent. They were to live for eternity. But immediately when they sinned, they become self-aware and began to die, spiritually and physically. Spiritually, the way they had life was to believe in God's promise, faith in the coming Messiah, the seed of the woman, Genesis 3.15. All right? So, all the Old Testament begins to unfold before us, if you've ever read the Old Testament. You'll see that, for some reason, God accepted the perfect sacrifice of an animal or offerings of fruit and whatnot. But they had to be the best of whatever it was. And then we learn in the Old Testament that there was sacrifices of these animals and that the blood from these animals was the life source. All right? And that would appease this spiritual substance we call God. And that animal blood would be applied to a person's sins and they would be removed until the next time that they sinned. Then that person had to bring another perfect sacrifice, the best he could find, and make an offering. And if they didn't have an animal, it just kept going down. If you're really poor, you certain things, doves, you could bring. All, all. So everybody was covered in this thing. But the central point was the introduction of the blood atonement. All right? So, all that we read about, and then we come to the part where Jesus is actually born. All right? So now, this is a part that's hard to understand, but we're talking about God. His ways aren't our ways. His thoughts not our thoughts. There's no way we can understand God. It's incomprehensible, okay? So, then the Holy Spirit of God comes upon this sinful woman named Mary who found favor with God, the Scripture says. She became pregnant through the Holy Spirit. She had a son. This was a God-human baby. All right? Now, you just got to take it for what it's worth right there, all right? So, now we have a God-man Jesus. But Jesus did not use his God powers to usurp over everyone else. He was a humble servant before men. All right? Then, to answer your question, Blue, about why did God's Son suffer so much at the cross? Again, I want to draw your attention to this part. Jesus was a God-man. Jesus was sinless and perfect. No sin in his life for 30-some years, 33 years, if we want to get technical, I guess. And he was just like Adam. Adam had no sin either. He had no awareness of right or wrong, the Bible says. He was innocent. He didn't know what wrong and right was because he, he was perfectly innocent. He had fellowship with God. Everything was grand and glorious. Jesus is the same. He had a perfect, sinless life. He was tempted, the Bible says, in all areas. The devil took him up on the temple and told him, I'll give you all these kingdoms, all the nations of the world. They're worshiping me. I'll give it to you if you'll fall down and worship me. Jesus said no. Jesus was perfect. All right? Now, the cross, the crucifixion, the scourging, everything begins to happen to Jesus, right? Now, you can follow. There was many, many people in the world that were crucified, just like Jesus. And some even worse, torturing, burned at the stake. Every, Nero, you read about him. Oh, and then even today, crazy things, dictators do their own people. Pol Pot, Hitler, Jews, I mean, it goes on and on. But at that time, Jesus, now this is a point that you really need to understand. 
Jesus took all the scourging, nailing on the cross, everything, crown of thorns, he took it all. And then there's one point on the cross where you read, Jesus says, to God. The man Jesus says, Why have you forsaken me, Father? All right? At that point, you understand, is when the God-man Jesus bore at that instant all of the punishment for all sins was placed on Jesus at that point right there. A man could not take all the punishments for all humanity. You understand? If in the Old Testament, if you had, if you did adultery, you were stoned to death. That was the punishment. Okay. So, can you imagine being stoned to death? Well, this this happened thousands and thousands and thousands of time over and over through the centuries. You understand, we're talking about thousands of years have passed and people doing all kinds of evil that we can read in the Old Testament how evil that was. Can you imagine what secular history was that said they're a Christian? We don't even know about and they committed sins. Like you today, you commit sins if you say you're a Christian because you had to go to God and say you're sorry. Well, in the Old Testament, there was a punishment for that. You had to be punished physically. This God part of Jesus, the God part at the cross when he said, Father, why have you forsaken me? He then, the God part of Jesus, took the punishment, the wrath of God, all of sin and punishment from the point that Adam disobeyed God to the, that's a past, the present, and into the future until God descends from heaven and brings heaven to this earth in Jerusalem in the future. All sin, all punishment for sin from Adam to that day that we read in the New Testament book of Revelation that God descends on this earth bringing the heaven to this earth all people that have sinned and require punishment for that sin, all of that punishment on all billions and billions and billions of adulterers, idolaters, all the false religions, three billion people in India, three billion people in China, billions of people around the world, the millions of idolaters and haters of God in the world, all of the punishment was placed on the God part of Jesus at that moment. He went down and in his death he resurrected himself freeing all the people since Adam that believed in what God said he was sending a Savior. They were held in a place that people call paradise. And Jesus took them to heaven, all the people who believed in God. Some of them never know what the Messiah was going to be like. Didn't know his name. They were in a holding till then. Today, when I say to you, Blues, if you're watching this recording, it'll come up on YouTube. Your sins have been forgiven for over 2,000 years. And all of your sins of your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, all your family, all your sins have been forgiven. by Jesus. When he died, he atoned for all sins of humanity. So today, 
people today don't realize that they are free of sin and death. It's the great gospel message of salvation that is to go forth to the world. And the salvation message is these three things. You will say to God, you're sorry for your rebellious life. Number two, you'll want Jesus as your Savior and Master and Lord. And three, you'll repent. Repent means to turn to the New Testament truths of Jesus and obey. Read and obey. Not what I say, not what some church house says, but what you read in the New Testament. Either you will obey the words you read and understand, or you won't. If you don't, you're going to hell. If you do, you're a saved person. You have to continue to be faithful until the end of your life. There's no sure thing. You can't say, well, yeah, I'm a Christian today, then go to Las Vegas and gamble. I was an addict, then got cancer and survived, and now drug-free six years. And, well, I guess, do you want me to congratulate you? I don't understand. You're going to hell. Okay? You're going to hell. It makes no difference if you, if you use drugs or didn't use drugs. You were going to hell before you start doing drugs. You were going to hell before cancer developed in your body. There's no difference. The, the plan of salvation is the same for all human beings. Number one, you're going to say to God, you're sorry for your rebellious attitude towards Him. Number two, you're going to embrace Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And number three, you're going to repent. Turn to the writings of the New Testament. You'll read the, new, the, you'll read the words of Jesus. You'll understand and you'll decide. Do I want to believe Jesus? It's that simple. All right. Today's the day of salvation. Nothing's changed. You need to yield to the Lord in your life. When you do, your life is going to take on a whole new meaning. You'll understand your destined purpose. I'll see you guys tomorrow, 9 o'clock Central Standard Time, right here on Periscope.